Jarvis, drop my needle. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The Venom Vlog. And today we're going to talk about Spider-Man No Way Home. And I'm going to get into spoilers and everything, uh, but I'll here in the first like minute or two, I'll give you my non-spoiler review. Um, that way you have time to switch off and stuff. So for my non-spoiler review for Spider-Man No Way Home, just remember when I was going into this, I was not very excited. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the newer Spider-Man movies. I'm not a hater of them. They're just kind of lukewarm to me. I think uh, Tom Holland does a good job or good enough job. Um, I think, you know, having it set in the Marvel Universe is neat. It adds something new to the you know, Spider-Man movies that we've seen before. And then also um, the villains, I think, have been great. I've actually really liked the Vulture and I like Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio. So outside of that, though, the side characters, Ned and um, uh, MJ and all these other characters, Flash, I'm not a big fan of. And to me, Spider-Man is kind of one of the elements that is, makes him so great and some of his stories so great is that his supporting cast is really, really good. And I just haven't enjoyed them too much in these movies. Now, some of you may disagree with that and that's fine, but just I'm just trying to paint a picture that I went into this movie with pretty low expectations. I was kind of scared because after the way the last movie ended where his, you know, Spider-Man's identity got revealed, I was very excited to see a, a personal story with Spider-Man. Okay, we're going to deal with identity. That's going to be the theme of this next movie. And it's going to be him on the run and he's going to be wanted. And I had this whole picture in my head. They're going to send Craven after him, whatever. Like I had this whole picture in my head of what the next movie could be. And it made me very, very excited. And then they were revealed, oh, we're doing, a, you know, like a multiverse story. And we're bringing back Sam Raimi villains and, uh, and Andrew Garfield villains. And I was like, what? <laughs> like that does not seem to the direction that this story should have gone in. Like it feels like the story after the, the next story. Um, so I, I wasn't very pumped, um, but I will say this for my, the last bit of my non spoiler review. Um, if you haven't seen this movie yet, go see this movie. <laughs> I, you know, I, this movie, it's had an amazing opening weekend and I'm sure it's going to have another great, you know, Christmas weekend too. Um, this movie is absolutely amazing. <laughs> like, like it's nostalgia bait, you know, but it, it's one of those nostalgia bait movies that does it really, really well. Like where you hope that things are handled with respect to what they're nostalgia, you know, pulling from for the nostalgia. And I felt like this movie did pay respect to that in a lot of ways. Um, so without, you know, saying any more, just go see this movie. If you haven't seen it, that's all I can say from a non-spoiler review is that you have to see this. If you're a Spider-Man fan at all, you have to see this movie. Um, and then now we're going to get into the spoilers <laughs> and I'm going to jump right into spoilers. So Go away if you haven't seen the movie yet. Go now. That's all you get from me. Um, the rest of you, buckle in. Let's talk. I want to hear all your spoiler thoughts down below. So stay away from comments. We don't want spoilers. Everyone can talk about spoilers down below. And as far as the post credit scene, um, you know, with our our boy Venom uh, or Eddie, we're gonna save that for the next video. So that's gonna I'm gonna make my own video on that uh, because it's you know Venom specific, and I just have a lot of thoughts on that. So we'll save that for the next video. So that won't be here. What we're going to talk about here is just the movie itself. And man, oh man, did I like this movie. I even kind of liked Ned a little bit in this movie. A little bit. I, although him getting the, the you know, taking the thing from Doctor Strange and being able to open portals and stuff, he wasn't great at it, you know. So I'm glad he didn't just, you know, gravitate to it instantly. But the fact that he did it did mean something because later on Doctor Strange even says, you open these portals? He's like, yeah. And he goes, what's your name? He's like, Ned Leeds. And he goes... Okay, like like Doctor Strange is going to keep an eye on him, you know, and I'm like, hey, okay, that could be a, you know, just a little nod, you know, that maybe Ned's story can go in, you know, in that kind of direction um, or not, you know, if they choose not to. So I thought that was cool. I thought that was really neat. And then um, and also MJ in this, like, I'm not a big fan of this version of MJ. Um, she's very dry. You know, I, I don't know if that's actually Zendaya's personality or or what, but she kind of, she comes across very dry sometimes. And not in like a, a charming way, usually. But in this movie, I actually found her a little bit more charming. Um, you know, and I, I don't know. I liked the line where she tells Doctor Strange, like, uh, you know, I know some magic words. And one of them starts with please. And I was like, okay, that was pretty funny. And that actually the line I thought was delivered kind of well. It's cheesy as hell, for sure. Um, but as someone who likes cheesy jokes, I was like, okay, that, I appreciated that. And, I'm, and she delivered it pretty well. Um, and so 
I felt like the humor in this with her was a little better handled. Like it was like they, okay, she is dry. So let's, let's actually like shoot it a different way and play it a different way. And I feel like they did that better in this one. I, you know, I'm still like eh, on those characters um, and flash and stuff, but I, I feel like they all had kind of funny moments like flash, you know, asking Sp Spider-Man is like, tell everyone I'm your best friend <laughs> and then hang out with me at school for a week. You know, I thought that was kind of fun, you know, and even though I don't really like that interpretation of flash, that moment was very, a very flash moment, you know, where, uh, where, you know, if he found out Spider-Man was Peter Parker, he probably would pull that kind of stuff. I think he even did. And when he was a uh, head in the comics, he was head of the uh, Spider-Man fan club and he was trying to get Spider-Man to come to the school and stuff. So all that stuff was just kind of neat. Um, but really the, the bread and butter here was, um, they stepped up Aunt May a little bit, uh, a, you know, a little bit. I, I feel like in the first two movies, she was just the hot aunt. And that kind of got on my nerves where it was like, oh, she only shows up to be the the joke of like, you know, Tony Stark's going to say, oh, your aunt's hot. And then Happy is going to, you know, date her and be like, you know, yeah, your aunt's really hot. It's like it seemed like that was the only place they could go to with that when they were at the restaurant, you know, him and Aunt May in the first movie and she, they're eating and someone like the waiter makes a comment on how hot she is or whatever. It's just like, oh, my God, is that all she's here for is just to be called hot by men? Uh, you know, and it just it just doesn't make her a character. I mean, I, I'm not I'm just that's my issue with it is that Aunt May, I actually like as a character in the comics. Um, and especially now in the comics where she's part of Feast and everything, like when she died in the Clone Saga, I thought that was a great ending. And then when they brought her back, I was like, man, you guys haven't done anything with her since you brought her back. And it wasn't until after one more day uh, that they actually started doing stuff with Aunt May again. And they made her part of Feast and they gave her a job. And uh, she interacted with characters like Mr. Negative and, uh, you know, and got married to J. Jonah Jameson's dad. Um, and so all those things. And she, you know, interacts with Dr. Octopus sometimes. So they actually make her a character again in the comics. Um, this movie, I felt like they were pushing her in that direction. Um, but really what you realize in this movie is that she is Uncle Ben. Um this Peter Parker has never actually heard the phrase with great power comes great responsibility. And that makes sense because he's never really said it or it's never really been said in any of the Marvel movies so far. So this is the movie where they give us that. And so what they do is they kind of build Aunt May up a little bit by making her, you know, being there for Peter, you know, as he's going through stuff, you know, as he's um, struggling with his identity being revealed. And that's kind of where the movie starts off and they brush over that so quick that's probably one of my biggest critiques of this movie was that they were like we got to get through this identity reveal thing um because we've got to get to the multiverse stuff and that's where i felt like they crammed what could have been a really good movie down into like 25 minutes and that bugged me um although we did get a great cameo uh from one of my other favorite marvel characters and played by the amazing charlie cox uh, we got daredevil shows up as matt murdoch so when peter's identity is revealed the cops bring them in, they question them, they find out, uh, they do some digging, they find out the drones actually weren't under Peter's full control, and that they're still kind of considered Tark, uh, Stark tech, um, That and they question Happy, and they're like, hey, there's still some stuff missing from Stark's, you know, files, um, so there's some equipment missing, so we need to talk to you about that, and Happy's like, I don't know what you're talking about, um, so they brush over the, the because the Mysterio thing ended with this big world-shattering your identity is revealed and I did it and I framed you for my murder. And then this movie in like 15 minutes, they, they wash right over that. Um, it feels like a Paul Anderson actually opening from Resident Evil. I just did a Resident Evil episode. So that's why I'm thinking about this. I still have the numbers up over here. Um, but uh, in Resident Evil, the movie would end on a cliffhanger and the next movie would pick up and in 10 minutes, they would wrap up that cliffhanger and then start a new story. And that's kind of what this felt like. It felt a little bit like that. And so I didn't really like the first chunk of this movie because I was like, no, I want, I want to see him be wanted. I want to see the, the Mysterio thing have a little bit more weight than just they do a little bit of digging and they find out he's innocent. I mean, I guess that makes sense. If they did a little digging, they would find out he's innocent, but it just seemed to happen so quickly. And the, but the main thing and the, the way they kind of brush over it was by introducing Matt Murdock and he's like hanging out with Peter and they're talking and he's like, yeah, look, I'm a really good lawyer. And then a brick comes through the window and he grabs it with his hand and they all know he's, they're looking at him because he's blind. He's got the cane and everything. And he's like, how did you catch that? And he goes, I'm a really good lawyer. <laughs> so I kind of like that. It was just like a neat little cameo, but it, it brings Charlie Cox's uh, Daredevil into the Marvel Universe, which is what I want so bad. Some of my favorite Spider-Man stories from the 80s were ones where he teamed up with Daredevil. I think the two of those guys together 
are fantastic. Uh, you know, almost as good as Doctor Strange and Spider Man because they're just they're kind of opposites. Like Doctor like or Daredevil and Spider Man are closer than Doctor Strange and Spider Man. They are definite opposites. You know, uh, but Daredevil I think has the heart of Peter Parker in a way, but sometimes his brain gets in the way. Like Peter. He struggles with things, you know, but his heart ultimately leads him a lot to the right places, minus the few mistakes he's made over the years. Daredevil makes a lot of mistakes, and it's because his brain keeps getting in the way of his heart, I think. Um, but I really, I also like that about Matt Murdock. I think it makes him flawed in, in an interesting way, in a very, uh, you know, relatable way. Um, so I like the character. So seeing him in this was great. Um, and then we also got, uh, well, I don't want to, I'm not going to spoil Hawkeye, but that, that I think there's, they're setting some up in Hawkeye too, which could tie into all this. Uh, I just watched episode five and I'm like, oh my God, okay, I can't wait for the finale. So, uh, so maybe I'll talk about it after I watch the finale, uh, but that could tie into, you know, that as well with, you know, with everything going on. So, um, so specifically with Daredevil and stuff. So I, again, I won't spoil here if you haven't seen Hawkeye, but go watch it. You know, I've watched five episodes now and I'm excited for the finale when that when that drops. So um so with this, you know, we have Daredevil after his cameo. Now Spider-Man is just he's going to school. You know, people are filming him, you know, walking around school. They're like, oh my God, it's you know, Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And it starts affecting his life in a different way. Like uh he's trying to go to college and he gets rejected from every college he applies to, but so do his friends. Because now that it's out there that he's, you know, Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Um, you know, which they have to move that, you know, that brick came through their window at, when they met Daredevil. So they move in with Happy Hogan and they live in his like, secured Stark apartment, you know, in downtown New York or whatever. Um, and uh, and so he but he's, you know, Peter's still going to school and he just doesn't get a break. Everyone's staring at him, looking at him, filming him, sitting in class and all these things. And his teachers are like sucking up to him, although one of them is like, no, Mysterio was right. <laughs> uh, so I thought that was kind of funny showing the duality of person, you know, uh, perspectives and opinions. Um and uh, I just thought it was good because uh, normally, you know, we're so used to the internet when we have vehement opinions about something on, on the internet, people scream and yell at each other. And in this movie, it was just like these guy, these three teachers having this banter, which I thought was really funny. Um, and none of them were like screaming at each other, but they were like, dude, you're embarrassing yourself. Shut up. Mysterio is a bad guy. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So all, all those little moments I thought worked for me, but really at the heart of this, the identity theme is what worked uh, because I think they, after that, wrap up in the first act and they got to what the meat of this story was going to be i think that's where the movie really does shine um you know peter like i said he's struggling he, he can't get into college now his girlfriend mj can't get into any colleges because they find out that she's dating peter parker so they don't want villains to come you know blow up the school same with ned they don't want anyone to attack him to get at, to get spider-man so they don't let them in any colleges and uh and so Spider-Man feels like, okay, I understand my identity got revealed and it, it's hurting me, but it's also hurting my Aunt May, um, who's breaking up with, you know, who broke up with Happy Hogan, but now they're staying in his, one of his apartments or whatever. Um, and then it also, like, uh, it, it's affecting um, Mary Jane's life moving forward and, and Ned's life moving forward. So Peter, I think in this movie, matures in a way that I wasn't ready for. I was hoping he would in the third movie after his identity gets revealed. But then when I heard this was a multiverse movie, I thought, oh, they're just going to do nostalgia things and it's not going to actually progress Tom Holland as an actor or as Peter Parker Spider-Man. And I was wrong big time. Um, I think he really shines in this movie because he makes adult decisions, um, which should happen. Peter Parker may be a teenager in the comic books or in the early comics and even in this timeline, but always at an early age, Peter made adult decisions. Um, even at 15 and 16, when he was Spider-Man, he made adult decisions, things that most adults don't do that it, because they're too selfish. Peter would make a lot of selfless decisions. And I felt like that's really at the heart of Peter. What Tom Holland nailed in this movie was the selflessness. He goes to Dr. Strange because Mary Jane and Ned's life uh, or MJ and, and Ned's life are ruined not so much his. So he just wants the world to forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man because then that will allow Ned and, you know, um, and MJ to get into the schools they want to go into. And meanwhile, um, Doctor Strange is not the Sorcerer Supreme anymore. Apparently after he blipped out of existence, Wong became Sorcerer Supreme. So Doctor Strange works for Wong and Wong is too busy going around the world like in Shang-Chi and Star Shang-Chi. He's going to different places around the world recruiting new characters like, uh, you know, Abomination and other people. So he's on a mission going somewhere 
And Doctor Strange is like, uh, okay, well, I'm going to be here with the kid. I kind of want to cast a spell. And Wong's like, don't do it. And he's like, okay, that's fine. But I kind of want to. And Wong's like, I don't want to have any part of this. And he's like, just don't screw anything up. And then he leaves. And so Peter and Doctor Strange go down in the basement, as we saw in the trailer, and they make they cast a spell. So that whole thing was neat. And then Peter keeps trying to make amends, uh, 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 addendums to the, the spell. He's like, hey, I, I want Mary Jane or MJ to still remember me. I would like Ned to still remember me and my aunt to still remember me. And every time he changes something, it's screwing up the spell. And luckily, Doctor Strange is able to contain the spell uh, before it completely goes bonkers. Uh, he's able to contain it and put it in this little cube thing. But enough damage has been done to where now the fact that the, the spell was even started and touched into the multiverse um, because of all the addendums, I guess, it kept causing branches to stick out. It starts pulling people in from other universes that know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Um, so I thought that was pretty neat um, that you have, uh, you know, Dr. Octopus shows up first and fights Peter on a bridge when he goes, when he tracks down the lady who works at the college. He tracks her down. He's trying to convince her to let Ned and MJ into the school. He's like, look, I won't go to the school. It's fine. Punish me. Just don't punish my friends. So he's going to try to convince her and Dr. Octopus shows up and they get in a great fight and Dr. Octopus is confused when he pulls off Peter's mask and he realizes um, you're not Peter Parker. And he's like, uh, yes, I am. And he goes, no, I, I was holding Peter Parker by the throat, which from the ending of the, the second movie, the, the Tobey Maguire movie, he's like, I was holding him by the throat and I was getting ready to kill him. Um, and uh, and then I was ended up here somehow. So uh, so I like that. He was plucked from a, a blip second, uh, you know, just a moment of, from his time period. And then same with uh, the Green Goblin. He was pulled right before, um, you know, before Tobe Maguire's uh, battle with him where the board stabs him in the chest. So he shows up and he's pumpkin bombing, you know, the bridge and everything. And Doc Ock is like, that's impossible. That's Norman Osborn. And he's like, what? And then they get teleported back to the Sanctum Sanctorum. So down in the basement of the Sanctum Sanctorum, where Peter, MJ, and Ned are all working together with Doctor Strange, there are these six chambers, you know, to lock these uh, visitors in. So Doctor Strange is like, look, there's a few visitors here. I have some chambers here. You can lock them all up in. Um, and then we're going to send them back to their world where they're going to die at the hands of Spider-Man. And Peter doesn't like this. He's like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to see them die. He's like, I, I don't want anyone to die. Um, that was the whole thing. Like, that's what caused all this. You know, uh, Mysterio died. And, and look at all the horrible things that have happened in my life because of that. He said, no, I, I saved Vulture and I couldn't save, um, you know, Mysterio. So I, I want I don't want these villains to die. I, I know they're bad people, but I want to help them. And uh, and Strange is like, we can't do that. We can't tamper with the multiverse because if you fix them and send them back, who knows what that can, that's going to do? And Peter's like, but we have a we have a chance here, right? Um, and that's where him and Aunt May have more conversations where she's you know hinting at the power responsibility line, but she doesn't say it right away. So that's whole, pretty much the whole setup. You have all this big thing. They start capturing Electro um, from the Andrew Garfield movies. He's not blue anymore. He doesn't have the gap in his teeth. He actually looks at the mirror and says, wow, I'm kind of handsome in this universe. He's like, I don't know what this, the energy here is different because it's powered by Stark energy. So he's like, so as he's absorbing it, it he's actually changing um, how he looks. And I, I kind of like that. I was like, oh, there's a good reason for it. Then they bring in Sandman from the Tobey Maguire movie. Um, so he's there and they lock him up on kind of on accident. It, at first, they don't want to fight Spider-Man. And so what they kind of do and they kind of don't. Uh, Sandman teams up with Spider-Man and then he then he turns on Spider-Man when he realizes he's not the you know same Spider-Man that he knows. So uh, so this is all just, you know, kind of the build up. So they capture all the villains. And then eventually Norman Osborn goes and talks to Aunt May and, you know, gives himself up. He gives himself to Peter and he says, look, I I'm in control right now. The goblin isn't. And while I'm in control, me and you need to like work something out so we can cure myself. And then we can cure um, Dr. Octopus from the, the arms, you know, controlling his mind. Maybe we can uh, cure Electro from the accident that, you know, happened to him and Sandman as well. And then also the lizard, um, which Dr. Strange captures, which I wish they would have shown that. I would have loved to seen a Dr. Strange lizard fight in this movie. That would have been really cool. But they kind of just brush over that. And so the lizard just pops up in the, in the cell. So... All these villains have now been captured. You got the five villains, uh, Sandman, Electro, Lizard, Doc Ock, and now Norman Osborn. And then the sixth member of the Sinister Six, which is a tree, <laughs> which gets taken by accident uh, when Spider-Man has this like gauntlet that Doctor Strange made him. 
and he shoots like a, a, a thing out of the gauntlet. If it, whatever it touches, it teleports back to the sanctum. And it missed Electro and hit a tree. So they have six members of the Sinister Six with the six members of tree, which I don't know. I just made me laugh. Uh, you know, I was like, okay, that's silly, but that's fine. This also pulled a little bit from the Ultimate Comics. In the Ultimate Comics, there were Sinister Six were five members and Spider-Man was the sixth. They actually talked Spider-Man into working with them by threatening his aunt. They kind of blackmail him. In this, they don't really blackmail him, but Norman Osborn is manipulating Peter to, you know, help, you know, help, you know, cure the others. But really, he has different plans. Uh, so Peter is trying to work on cures for them, brings them back to Happy Hogan's apartment. They they lock, uh, or he gets in a fight with Doctor Strange and locks him up uh, above the Grand Canyon in like the, the you know, when the universe turns into like a prism, like the bad guy from the first movie, the first Doctor Strange movie, he, uh, Caselius or whatever his name was, he, he caused everything to turn into prisms and they were like in a different, like a mirror universe kind of thing. Well, they, Spider-Man locks Doctor Strange in there, chained up above the Grand Canyon and takes his little teleporter thing and that's how Ned gets it. So, uh, so that, so Doctor Strange is missing through most of the second and uh, first part of the third act of this movie. And it's really just Spider-Man working with these villains until they betray him. Um, and when Norman Osborn betrays a man, he really betrays uh, Spider-Man, like big time. Um, and he uh, pushes it so hard that he, first of all, the fight between him and Spider-Man in Happy Hogan's building is amazing. It's a great fight. Um, but then it ends up in the, like down in the lobby of the, the building. And that's where Aunt May is attacked by Green Goblin and is essentially killed. She gets injured really badly. And then another time she was about to get killed and you think Spider-Man deflected it, but the first blast where she got hit by the Goblin Glider, it stuck her so bad that she was bleeding out. So she stands up and she actually has this moment where she's talking to Peter and she's like, I just, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. She actually says the Uncle Ben line um, because Uncle Ben told it to her all the time, but Uncle Ben never said it to Peter in this universe, which is something we've all wondered. So he finally gets his Uncle Ben moment and it's here with his Aunt May. And this scene I thought was handled really, really well. She, uh, Marissa Tomei did a great job. Uh, she falls in his arms, he's holding her and she's slowly dying, but she's repeating, like she's just, it's so heartbreaking. She just keeps repeating herself. Like, I just need to catch my breath. I just need to catch my breath and I need to catch my breath. And then she just, she dies in his arms. Um, and now Spider-Man, this Spider-Man, has, like I said, his Uncle Ben moment, but he also has um, an enemy that actually delivered on some of the threats his previous enemies made. Like, remember uh, Vulture, I think in the first movie, threatened to hurt Peter through his family and stuff like that. And Mysterio definitely, you know, hint he hinted at that too with, you know, hurting his girlfriend and stuff. So in this case, um, a villain actually does it. And it's, it's Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin from the Tobey Maguire universe. So when Peter's at his lowest, he... he after he loses Aunt May, the cops show up because he's wanted. Um, they show up. He's not supposed to be running around as Spider-Man. And, uh, they're, you know, they shoot at him. And I think he gets hit. I think one of the bullets hits him, but he gets away. And he takes the stuff that Aunt May was holding on to, um, which was some of the stuff he was using to cure the villains uh, that they didn't complete. Uh, but Aunt May scooped it all into a bag and took it with her. And so when she died, she handed it to Peter right before she died. Um, and so he runs off with it. And it turns out that's going to be very vital because as he's laying low, this is where the big the big thing everyone was speculating, right? Uh, the, the big part of the movie, which was the other Spider-Man show up. Uh, Ned is working on uh, opening a portal. And what he does is he opens up a portal to an alleyway. He's like, I need to see, I need Peter Parker. We need to find Peter Parker. And a portal opens to an alleyway. And they see someone in a Spider-Man costume waving at him. And then the person walks into the light. And it's freaking Andrew Garfield. And, and let me tell you, when Charlie Cox showed up on screen, there was a huge applause. When Andrew Garfield showed up on screen, there was a massive applause, man. So many people were excited to see that guy again. And that made me realize, like, I'm not, if I had to pick my least favorite Spider-Man movies, it's certainly the two Andrew Garfield movies, but it has nothing to do with Andrew Garfield. Those movies, I think, are just not good movies, in my opinion. Uh, and they're not good Spider-Man movies, although they have one of the best Flash Thompson moments out of all of them. And I love Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy. But I just didn't like Lizard as a villain. I didn't really like Electro in the second movie or Rhino um, or Goblin in the second movie. Like, none of that stuff worked for me. Um, but uh, Andrew, I thought, was a good Spider-Man. Uh, you know, I, I thought he was a little too 
aggressive with his humor like in those movies i didn't think he was like slapsticky kind of funny or goofy funny like peter parker normally is he was more like bully funny in a way like not even funny sometimes just full-on bully um but uh so i didn't really fully like his version or that version of the character but him as an actor he's really great and so when he showed up in this it was great to see him honestly um and, uh, and that made me realize, like, you know, that he just deserved better. Like, that in that moment, when hearing everyone cheering for him and stuff, and, and then looking at him and watching him portray Peter again in this movie, it just made me realize this guy is a great Peter Parker, Spider-Man. He just got a bad deal, in my opinion, with those movies. Uh, now, some of you may, out there may like those movies, and that's fine. I'm not, I'm not here to debate all that. I just... For me, I didn't like those movies, but still when I saw them, I was excited. And then so they open another portal because they're like, no, this isn't the right Peter. We need another Peter. And uh, and then they open a portal and then Tobey Maguire comes through and he's just in regular clothes. Uh, so this was all neat because earlier they said we're this, this spell pulled in people who knew Spider-Man's identity into this universe. Um, not everybody, but it pulled in a few visitors. But apparently it also pulled in two Spider-Men. So I'm curious about that because obviously Venom uh, ended up in this universe if you watch the post credit scene, which we'll talk about in the next episode. But uh, my friend um, uh, Eddie, I think, or yeah, I think he told me this before, but he was like, you know, this that character is, um, you know, he, he the suit must know who Spider-Man is. That's why he got pulled into this world. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I don't really know. I'm not really putting too much thought into all that. But two Spider-Man also showed up. Um, so who knows really what reason Eddie is in this world. But we'll talk more about that in the next episode. But uh, but we, we, will, we will see him. So apparently six Sinister Sixes showed up. There were six villains, kind of, if you count Venom. But he just showed up in Mexico. <laughs> All the others were in New York fighting Spider-Man when they got pulled into this world. Um, so uh, and they all showed up kind of in spots where they were in their respective worlds uh, for the most part. So um like like Dr. Octopus uh, was fell into the river, but in this movie, he shows up on the bridge that's above the river. So there was like things like that where I'm like, oh man, that's crazy. Like uh, Electro was out near um, Oscorp bouncing through electrical grids, uh, you know, fighting Spider-Man. And in this movie, he shows up outside of an electrical grid um, outside of town. Uh, so I guess the geography of the worlds are just that much different. So I just thought that was kind of neat too. So there was just all these little things like that in the movie that I thought paid a lot of respects to what came before, but certainly the performances from Andrew and Toby were awesome. One thing I think the, the Spider-Man fandom, which I, I think I hate the most about, uh, is the, a lot of Spider-Man fans argue over who the better Spider-Man is. And to me, I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like, it's like arguing whoever the best Superman is. Like, I, I realized really early on, it's not worth fighting that fight because it's only going to matter to what you like. So like I like uh, you know Christopher Reeve Superman obviously, uh, but uh, but I also like Tom Welling's uh, Clark Kent Superman on Smallville, um, and I like uh, Tyler Hawkins Superman and uh, Clark Kent on Superman and Lois, um, and uh, and so there's there's a different and then obviously there's Henry Cavill and but everyone likes to fight over who's the better one, and what I kept hoping for this movie was if all three of these Spider Men are in this movie, I hope it causes some of those people to stop having that fight and realize that all three of these guys are cool just like all the people who've played spider-man or superman dean kane like all of them and tom welling they're all great you know in their own ways they're all great and they represent a part of the character that's very important to represent on screen um, or bring something new to the character that needs to be brought in that's what's so great about all these actors playing these roles and seeing these three on screen together Honestly, I know that's all nostalgia, nostalgia bait, you know, whatever, but they didn't miss a beat. They, it's like they came right from the movies, just like Alfred Molina did when he ended up playing Doc Ock and Willem Dafoe playing uh, the Goblin. Like, it's like they came right out of their movies. Even um, uh, Jamie Foxx as Electro, like all of them felt like it, like it mattered that you've seen every Spider-Man movie. That's how I felt about Spider-Verse. What I really liked about that movie was that if you've read the comics, if you've seen the movies, like that movie, like the Lego Batman movie, it references everything. Every form of Spider-Man that's been out there, they reference it in some way. And that's what made that work. So you, that movie works because it's part of the web, right? It, it, it's part of the, uh, it's built off the foundation of all these other great interpretations from before. Same with this. 
this movie, when people say if it's their favorite Spider-Man movie, it's not my favorite Spider-Man movie, but it's in the top three. It's because you can't have this movie without the other movies. You just can't at all. Um, it wouldn't work on the level that it does in this one because Andrew Garfield gets a chance to redeem himself in this. Um, you know, in the final battle when they're fighting at the Statue of Liberty, which is getting a Captain America shield put on it, uh, everyone descends there. Doctor Strange shows up. Uh, you know, Ned's opening portals. They're trying to keep the villains away. They got all the cures. They're, you know, like they spend a whole, they stop the movie for like 30 minutes to have all three Peter Parkers go to a science lab and create cures for all the villains. Not to kill them, to cure them of the things that enhance their abilities and powers. Um, so they're going to cure, cure the Oz serum. They're going to cure the, the effects the legs have over Doc Ock, which they kind of do earlier in the movie. So Doc Ock disappears for a while at this point. Um, but they want to cure the lizard. They want to cure Electro and Sandman. And then they want them to go back to their worlds cured, right? And uh, instead of dying at the hands of Spider-Man, going back and being cured in their final battles with Spider-Man. All of that, just the possibilities, right? I was like, oh my God. And when you meet Andrew, he says, you know, after Gwen died, I started, I stopped pulling my punches. I started hurting people like villains, like badly. He's like, so I'm not doing too good, you know, in my life. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get by. I never fell in love again. And I'm just kind of alone. And it, it sounded heartbreaking to hear that, you know, that Gwen's death affected on that. I mean, because of course we know the effect of it in the comic books because Peter still feels it. But in the movies, that was it. The movie, that universe ended. So we never got to see him dealing with Gwen and the pain of losing her. So, uh, at past that one scene of the at the end of the movie, so in this one um, we get to see that, and he gets a chance when MJ falls off, um, you know, Statue of Liberty. Tom Holland goes to Weber, and the Green Goblin knocks him out of the way, so that she'll die. But that's when Andrew Garfield dives in, and saves her himself, and he catches her and lands, and when he's holding her, the look on his face, dude, this guy, that guy's a great actor. He he starts crying. And she's like, why are you crying? And he goes, he's like, I don't know. You know, he's like, but he does know. Like he, he knows he just proved to himself that he does have what it takes to save people um, and that he has what it takes to be Spider-Man. And I think being around these other Spider-Man, a younger one and an older one than him, he's getting all these perspectives. You know, he, there's this great banter between them when, you know, Spider-Man's like, yeah, I went to space and fought an alien. And then, you know, Tobey Maguire's like, well, I fought an alien, but he came to New York and he was like made of black goo or something. And, you know, and Tom Holland's like, oh, I haven't experienced anything like that. And then, you know, Andrew Garfield's like, wait a minute, you guys fought aliens? He goes, God, I'm so lame, man. He's like, I haven't fought any aliens. He's like, I fought a guy in a rhino suit. Does that, is that cool? You know, and, uh, and Toby's like, it is cool, man. And he goes, he goes, hey, hang on a second. He's like, my back hurts, which is a throwback to the, you know, Spider-Man and Tobey Maguire movies. And Andrew's like, you want me to crack it for you? <laughs> Which is a throwback to kind of his movies. So he's like, yeah. And so he grabs him and he cracks Tobey Maguire's back. And all that stuff in this movie is, it's silly. It's goofy. It's, it's, uh, you know, you know um, kind of um, nostalgia, you know, uh, fulfilling, I guess. But what it, what it did also was it, it mattered to the characters, you know, like everything in this is, it matters to the characters. Andrew getting a second chance to save, um, you know, MJ, it mattered to him. Toby gets a chance. Uh, Tom Holland wants to straight up kill Norman Osborn. He, they cure everyone else. They cure all the villains, uh, return them back to their normal selves. Doc Ock shows up to help them out against the villains. Doctor Strange is there to help out too. And he's trying to prevent the, the because more ripples are happening and opening as more people are, you know, they're all converging. So now you start seeing like Rhino and, and um, Craven the Hunter, I think. And you see like a bunch of other villains that are starting to get pulled into the universe and uh, and Doctor Strange can't stop it and so there's a ticking time clock now and so Spider-Man or Tom Holland um you know goes to kill Green Goblin to put an end to this and Tobey Maguire stops him he you know uh, Tom Holland grabs the glider and the blades are out and he's going to kill him the same way that you know he died in his universe which is impalement from the glider and as he's bringing it down to stab Norman uh, Toby shows up and is holding it and stops him. And he's like, we can't do this. He's like, this is not us. And he's like, uh, you were right. We have to save these people. And of course that backfires because then Toby gets stabbed from behind by Norman. So then you think, oh crap, is, is he going to die? Because he mentions that in his universe, him and MJ are still working things out. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, you know, it's been tough, you know, but we we're working it out. Like we're, we're together and stuff. And I liked hearing that too. Cause I'm like, I, I we don't get a lot of, end of the road Spider-Man stories, like where he ends up, 
we don't really get that told very often. And the comics are constantly keep going, so we never really get it in the comics. And the movies would be a perfect opportunity to do that, and they don't really do that either. Um, so it was nice to just hear. It was like Spider-Verse when you saw there was a Spider-Man that was married to MJ and he had blonde hair. And then there was a Spider-Man that was like not because they broke up and he got like chubby and stuff and uh, and kind of stopped being Spider-Man. Like, I just like seeing all of this. Like that show, I mean, that's how much I like this character and seeing like these different interpretations all come together was just amazing. Like it's just nothing short of amazing. And yes, nostalgia, all that crap, you know, like that. But to me, nostalgia is not bad if as long as you honor what's there. And that's what I felt like. It's like, this could have easily been just a mess of a movie, which I thought it was going to be. Oh man, all these different characters and different universes. Instead of telling a, a simple Spider-Man story. No, they tell a story about identity in this and how important it is to have a secret identity. Because that was the one thing about the MCU is they don't really deal with secret identities that much. This movie proved why it's so important to have one. Because at the end, after Tobey Maguire is stabbed, he ends up living, um, but they cure Norman Osborn. Uh, they stab him with the, the serum and they, you know, convert him back to just being Norman without the goblin uh, stuff in him. And then Doctor Strange sends them all back to their world and the three Spider-Men get to say their goodbyes. They give each other a big hug. And uh, and I thought it was great. I thought all that stuff was awesome. And then Peter goes to Doctor Strange and says, there's only one way to fix this. Everybody in the world has to forget I'm Spider-Man. No exceptions, no addendums. Everyone has to forget who I am. And uh, that for me was really heartbreaking as someone who struggles with memory and stuff um, to make that decision that you have to, you, you, he goes to MJ and he says, you're going to forget who I am. And Ned, you're going to forget. And MJ, you know, uh, says, well, if you want me, to, if you want to win me over again, since you're, I'm going to forget you, say this to me next time you see me. And I'll, I'm sure it'll sweep me off my feet. Um, it'll certainly make me interested in you. And she said, just say these words. And he's like, okay. And then all their minds get wiped. And the end of the movie is everyone back. J. Jonah Jameson, who was great. He pops up a couple times in the movie saying Spider-Man's still a menace, but no one knows his identity, you know, and everything. Uh, Mysterio never outed it, you know, I guess, or or um, what something happened where that information didn't get out there. And so, uh, so but now no one remembers. Um, Aunt May's dead and Happy Hogan dated her and he knew of Spider-Man, but he didn't know Peter was Spider-Man. And he didn't know who Peter Parker was, he, but he still dated Aunt May. This is where it gets a little messy. Um, but at the same time, it's like messy in that comic book kind of way. But Peter and Happy Hogan are at Aunt May's grave. And Happy's like, how did you know Aunt, you know, how did you know May Parker? And he's like, um, oh, through Spider-Man. And then Happy's like, yeah, me too. But he doesn't know who Peter is. Um, never knew about her nephew. Um, MJ doesn't remember. So MJ is working at her diner where Ned comes by sometimes and, you know, hangs out and plays on his phone. And, uh, and he, he finds out that they both got into the colleges they want to go into and something about Peter, he, he wrote down what to say to MJ and he doesn't say it. He chooses not to because he sees them both going off to have a good life. And again, it's so Peter Parker to make a decision like that, right? It's so heartbreaking that he would choose something selfless instead of giving him what he wants um, or what he feels like he deserves after everything he's been through. He still doesn't take it when it's offered. And so he doesn't say the thing to, to MJ because he wants her to have a good life. And he thinks a life without him is, is a better one. And we're, they're all at a clean slate. So he's like, no, she's going to go to college. I don't want villains to go there hurting her. I don't want villains to go hurt Ned. I'm not going to go introduce myself to him either. And I'm just going to go figure out what to do now. And so he goes and gets a small rinky-dink apartment, Tobey Maguire style, um, and he gets a sewing kit and he makes the best looking Spider-Man costume that we've ever seen on screen. Um, it is not a Tony Stark uh, design. It is not anything um, like that. It is classic Spider-Man with the small black spider symbol on his chest. Uh, you know, Steve Ditko style. It's, it's, man, it's so awesome. Seeing him swing around at the end of this movie like that was just amazing. So I know I, I kind of just recapped a lot of the movie, but I wanted you to see how I it made me feel talking about these scenes. And there's so much more to talk about. So feel free to, you know, drop your thoughts in the comments and I'll respond and we'll continue talking down there. But man, this movie was something else. It really blew me away. I did not expect it to be nearly this good. And although I have criticisms of it and how it kind of wrapped over the story that I wanted them to tell, they still told a story about identity. They still told a very Peter Parker story a very selfless uh, hero story uh, through the uh, lens of Peter Parker and Spider-Man. 
and uh, they put him in a spot to where he's essentially a soft reboot. He can exist in the Marvel Universe, but no one knows who he is. Um, or he can, you know, be part of the Sony Universe, and he has a new supporting cast because you can now introduce other characters. You don't have to do MJ or Ned, considering they don't have the memories of him. They could basically leave this franchise if they choose. I mean, basically, what I saw at the end of this movie was what I saw at the end of the last movie, which was potential. The But this movie has a lot of potential for... You could do a story where it all gets undone and people remember him again, or he does talk to MJ eventually. You could still do that story, or you could do a completely new story and bring in new side characters and new everything. Um, there's just so much that, that can be done. Um, I would actually really like, uh, they announced the second Spider-Verse movie across the Spider-Verse part one. I would really like it if that movie ended where they, because if you notice in the trailer they showed us, the teaser, Miles is going to two different universes and the animation style changes. And I was like, you know what would be really cool is if Miles goes to this universe where uh, where he meets Tom Holland Spider-Man and you get a real life actor playing Miles and then boom, you have Miles. <laughs> you have a, a live action Miles um, built from the animated universe because uh, he could wake up and go, whoa, look at my hands and then it's first person and then he looks up in a mirror and you see an actual actor playing Miles um, and that could be how the Spider-Verse part one ends and then part two can start with a little bit of live action and then go into the animated stuff. So that way you can have Tom Holland do the voice of Spider-Man uh, and join them throughout the rest of the movie or something. I mean, I don't know. I'm just thinking of all these different possibilities, but that's what I mean. That's how this movie made me feel at the end was the potential. It's just like all over the place, but in like good ways and positive ways. So, uh, and you can still tell a Craven story. You can still tell a lot of stuff. Um, I'm really curious to see where they would go with this franchise from here because they announced that they're going to do three more of these Spider-Man movies apparently, but what universe he's set in, we don't know. Um, I'm thinking he's just going to be mainly Sony, but then Marvel can still use Spider-Man in their movies if they need to. And I think that's kind of where they're at right now, but you guys can correct me if I'm wrong about that. I think it's Spider-Man solo movies are now just Sony, but he can still appear in Marvel movies if they want him in things like Avengers or anything like that. So um, if that's the case, I mean, let me know if I'm wrong about that, let me know too. I know there are people out there that aren't big on these movies. Like I said, I'm not the biggest uh, Spider-Man fan for these MCU movies, but this one was different because um, the tone of it felt very much like a Sam Raimi movie and a little bit like an Andrew Garfield. And it wasn't, it was before those guys even showed up in the film. Um, the, the pace and the tone was just way different than the MCU movies we've seen before. There were still those goofy MCU jokes from time to time, but once you got past like the first act, this movie, became like it felt like a real spider-man story um which i didn't think was possible to do with the busyness of a multiverse story but i was proven wrong big time um in fact i got so proven wrong that something i was kind of excited about before which is the flash movie i'm even more worried about that now because i'm still worried these multiverse movies do worry me oh different versions of different characters like eh, I, I don't know it, it, i don't know if it'll pay off or feel like it pays off this one did and it did it so well that i'm i just I don't have a lot of faith in Warner Brothers when it comes to their live action films. So even though they have a good director on that movie, um, I'm still worried that uh, The Flash won't deliver the heart that this movie ended up having um, with Toby and Andrew. Like, I don't think if Michael Keaton popping up in that, I, I hope it's not just a, it's not like the, the what I was scared of this movie, just them showing up, having a few lines, throwing a punch or two, and then leaving the movie with no real ramifications. That's what I thought this movie was going to have, and it didn't at all. They Toby was the Toby Spider-Man, and he, he was an extension from that movie, from his last movie, the third film. And then same with Andrew. He was an extension of his second film, like, in all the best ways. And they and all the things that were like, oh, the organic webbing, people don't like that. Well, they touch on that in this movie. They're like, wait, webbing shoots out of you? Like, they just, they cover it all, and it's great how it's handled. But it doesn't like they don't make fun of each other. They're they're kind of laughing with each other, like, oh my god, you do this in your universe. Well, I do this in mine. And it just made me think, man, I wish fans could be like that. I wish fans could go, see, your version's cool. I don't like it, but you know, you do. And but he was cool in this movie. So all right, fine. You know, like we can stop yelling at each other. Like I just wish fans were like that. <laughs> you know, when I was watching this movie, I was like, man, this is like this this is fiction <laughs> because on the internet. Uh, everyone's going to still fight over like which one's better. Um, but to me, all three, they've always cast good people to play Spider-Man and seeing them all together in this was more than just uh, a nostalgia fulfillment. It was also um, 
Spider-Man and wish fulfillment. Like it was just something I've always wanted to see in a way, but just never thought would be possible or handled as well as this was. And I'm still critical of the movie. There's still beats in it that I didn't like, but the the three Spider-Man and the villains they fought in this, they were handled really well. And everyone got their moment. Even Doctor, even the lizard had like a small moment when he gets cured and you see the actor again. And there's like a conclusion there between him and Andrew Garfield. And Electro, there's a conclusion there between him and Andrew Garfield where they mention Miles uh, in a roundabout way. And I mean, just really, really cool. Um, really cool stuff. And and I would say if you haven't seen it, um, well, you should. You should have seen it because you're watching this whole spoiler discussion and rant about it. Or not rant, but just like ramble, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, I, let me know your thoughts. You've seen it, obviously. So let me know down below, what did you think of Spider-Man No Way Home? I mean, this movie is doing so well. And uh, after today, I think it made a huge uh, a bunch of money today. And it's like a weekday. And they, they're saying that over over the weekend or maybe even uh, sometime middle of next week, it could actually hit a billion dollars and be the first movie during the pandemic to actually do that. And that's just mind-blowing, but well-deserved. Uh, in my Resident Evil episode I just talked about, I said that that movie deserved to make no money at the box office because it was terrible. This movie deserves every penny it makes and more. Um, it's that much fun. And, uh, and I can't recommend it enough. But I'm sure... You probably feel the same way if you made it through this gush fest that I had. Um, but if you have any negatives you want to say about the movie, any criticisms, anything you agree with me with, disagree with me, whatever it is, let me know down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. Um, but it's getting late. I might make one more video, the Venom one, and then I'm probably going to wrap up for the night. And I'll try to get these out to you guys in the next week or so. Um, you know, with Christmas coming up, hopefully I can get all these out to you guys soon. Um, I'm supposed to have a few days off at Christmas, but I got other things I got to work on. So I'll do my best. Uh, definitely by the end of the year. You'll see this video, though, and the next one for sure. So thank you so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you all in the future. Peace.